Happy Friday, everyone. I'm Marcy Craig Post, and I'm the Executive Director of the International Literacy Association. I'd like to welcome all of you this afternoon to our I ILA National Recognition Symposium, celebrating excellence and equity in literacy professional preparation programs. Today's program will highlight the what, why, and when of ILA national recognition, in addition to outlining the specifics of your literacy professional preparation program can be not recognized by ILA. We have several guests with us who will speak to their experience of their institution's program that have gone through the national recognition process. And we're also going to share with you some information on the application process for interested programs and how to become a program reviewer. Uh, there's also going to be some time for Q&A toward the end of the program. So just a few housekeeping items before we get started. First, please note that if you would like to pose a question, you may post it in the Q&A box. We will do our best to answer as many as we can during the live event. And for those questions we might not get to, we encourage you to reach out to us by email at ilanationalrecognition at reading.org. That's ILA national recognition at reading.org. Second, the archived closed captioned recording of this webinar will be available within the next 10 days. You will receive an email from ILA uh, following this event once the on demand recording is available. And you're also going to be able to access that at ILA national recognition.org. So before we get started, um, I also want to extend my sincere thanks to a couple of people. One, to Dr. Diane Kern, ILA's National Recognition Program Coordinator. I want to thank Ange Angela Ribel, our Project Coordinator, and Marcy Moore, our Assistant to National Recognition. These three women have worked tirelessly to bring you today's symposium, and they're working constantly on national recognition. They're going to be here throughout the program to present information and ask your questions. So many, many thanks to them for their dedication to ILA's National Recognition Program. So at this time, I would like to introduce the ILA National Recognition Program Coordinator, Dr. Diane Kern. Diane is a professor of ELA and Literacy at the University of Rhode Island School of Education. She has helped implement the standards through accreditation and certification programs for many years and co-chaired with Rita Bean on the most recent revision of the Standards for Literacy Professionals preparation. She's also been instrumental in providing gui guidance and coordination to ILA from the inception of the National Recognition Program to the present. It's my pleasure to introduce today, Diane. Thank you so very much, Marcy. It's a pleasure to be here with our presenters and all of our attendees. Let me just get my slide deck up and we will go. Should I do one more thing? Okay, good to go. All right, welcome everybody. So for our agenda today, um, you already had our welcome and my role is to help you in, in the session to help you with an overview of the ILA national recognition and ILA national recognition with distinction processes. And then we'll watch a video that ILA staff made about how to apply to become a reviewer and also how to um, apply for national recognition for uh, your programs. And we'll have some breaks built in between, um, but then we'll have a spotlight with Loyola University, Maryland, who is here with us today. Time to talk with them about their experience and uh, some tips, words from the wise. And then we'll have a spotlight conversation with the University of North Georgia. And that's an elementary intermediate uh, reading, uh, reading um, actually classroom teacher program. So um, without any further ado, let's go forward. So what, why, and when? So the what is ILA national recognition? National, we have two programs, national recognition and national recognition with distinction. And in this presentation, I'm going to um, share some details about that. So the national recognition process begins with a self-study. 
and there is um, a self-study template that we share with you. And the first will be familiar for anyone who's written any kind of accreditation or national recognition report. It's just your program's background, the context, um, some information. Then the second section is a little bit different than what you may have experienced with other accreditors. And if you had ILA national recognition in the past, we've revised this. We have we still have the key assessments, that part you'd probably be more familiar with. Um, what is your assessment system and share samples of um, your assignments that you give to your students. But then we've added curriculum. We want to understand how you teach literacy to your candidates. And so you include your syllabi, for example, in one of the appendices. And uh, you also uh, show us your CVs, this is familiar, the key assessment directions, and then how your assessment is aligned to ILA 2017 standards. Our process is designed, uh, is research-based and designed uh, with the values that ILA holds, the research that informs best literacy uh, professional preparation. But we redesigned this so that if you do submit to a national accreditor, such as CAPE or AQEP, that you can, you'll see that you'll be able to still use the six to eight key assessments if you're submitting to CAPE. And if you're um, submitting to AQEP, the newer accreditor, uh, you'll see that uh, some of their questions will also align uh, to the process. So what is national recognition? Uh, it is a supportive collegial process. It is the only way that you can get peer review for an elementary intermediate classroom teacher program or reading literacy specialist program, um, advanced licensure program. ILA um, has a cadre of 50, 60 peer reviewers waiting to provide support to you and encouragement about the things that you are doing well and that are up to date with the research and best practices. And we're also here to coach you and support you in a collegial process um, along the way. Our, our presenters from Loyola and University of North Georgia will tell you a little bit more firsthand about that experience. This process is confidential and um, the peer you don't it's a blind peer review process you don't know who your peer reviewers are and they um, hold your materials confidential and don't discuss them with anyone else except for the peer review team there's typically uh, three sometimes even four peer reviewers on your team for every program that you submit so if you submit both elementary classroom teacher and a reading literacy specialist, you'd have a team of four on one report and another team of four on the other. They wouldn't do both. Your, um, you get a detailed report back from your peer reviewers and we share the rubric that we've designed to make this transparent and so that you can self-assess that all of the components of every standard is addressed in your program. So for those of you who may have um, gotten ILA national recognition from us in the past, there were rules like you didn't have to have all standards or there was a preponderance of the evidence. Um, that's not true anymore. ILA national recognition that we designed ourselves for our standalone program requires that every standard and every component of the standard meets the standard on the rubric. If you earn national recognition, decision number one, and there are 65% or more uh, components of each standard that are in that meet the standard category, or actually, sorry, that are in the distinguished category. So the categories are um, uh, meet the standard, uh, does not meet the standard or distinguished. If 65% of your rubric scores come up to distinguished, you would get this first decision. Um, you would be awarded national recognition from ILA, and then you'd be recommended to move forward with the distinction process. And that's what I'm going to go over with you next. The next decision would be ILA national recognition 
and you would have it for five years and there is a renewal process. Uh, you don't have to go through the distinction process that I'm about to explain to you, um, but it's certainly an option if um, you earn that 65% or more. The next category, which I think is so helpful, um, I'm a faculty member at the University of Rhode Island and, and done many of these uh, reports. Actually, I write um, a secondary English report. I used to write um, ILA reports. Um, but when you, in the past processes, the, you'd get your decision and then you'd have to wait six months to a year to put it back in. We've designed a minor revisions resubmit and you have a month or so because they're so minor that we just couldn't find a few things. Uh, we just need to clarify some things and then we would most likely either award national recognition or national rec uh, recognition with recommendation for distinction. Um, and you just had some a few more things to submit to us. So there's no more waiting uh, for the mystery of, of what um, your peer reviewers have uh, found. And then the least favorable decision, but nonetheless a very formative, supportive decision, is we ask you to clarify and expand your program fundament fundamentals and resubmit. And you have a choice as to when you resubmit. If you still have a lot of work to do with your assessment system, you might want to submit in a year. Um, some people are ready to submit in six months and you just work that out with ILA. So now the national recognition with distinction. If you have that 65% or more um, distinguished marks on the rubric, then you are invited to um, have a virtual site visit with um, two peer reviewers. And of course you do get to know who they are because they're going to uh, visit you. This is a sample of what, the, it's, a, it's, a two, it's a one and a half day virtual visit. And this is a sample of the first day, and uh, you can take a longer look at that. Um, and we recently had um, one of the programs that you're going to hear from have a site visit, so they'll, a virtual site visit, so they'll be able to explain a lot more with you and what that was like. And then the second day is a half day where the peer reviewers or site visitors, um, is the word I should be using, um, work on their report. Uh, they don't share your report yet because it takes more time to synthesize, but they give a brief exit conference with any of your um, key personnel, faculty, department chair, dean, to help them, uh, to help you understand what strengths they saw and, and what areas that they may um, still have coaching uh, tips for you on. They do not make the decision. Um, ILA makes the decision, but they write a recommendation report for national recognition with distinction. The, um, with COVID, um, all of the challenges we've had with COVID, one of the things is that we've been able to practice having virtual site visits and all of us have gotten much more adept at Zoom and other video conferencing tools. So ILA has made the decision to keep the um, site visit virtual even after the pandemic and we will offer a face-to-face -face site visit if that's what your program um, is interested in. You will have to pay the um, the two site visitors expenses, travel expenses. So we see this as a, as a wonderful choice for you to make. Um, virtual, um, there's no travel, there's no meals, et cetera. But it would be fun to go to your campus. Okay, so the national recognition with distinction decisions. There are only two of them. One is that you are awarded ILA national recognition with distinction, and that is also five years and there's a renewal process. And then the other decision is award ILA national recognition with distinction, but there are some revisions that we'd like for you to submit. And we will work with you on what that timeline will be. So you still maintain your ILA national recognition and we support and coach you toward the distinction. So what roles does ILA nationally recognize at this time? We recognize reading literacy specialist advanced programs, uh, endorsement programs uh, that align to ILA standards 2017. And we also 
added the elementary intermediate classroom teacher national recognition process. So last what, I think it's the last what slide is, so what are the standards for the preparation of literacy professionals? Uh, many of you I'm sure are familiar with these, but I will just go over uh, the high, high points for each of them. So foundational knowledge, we had those in standards 2010, or excuse me, we had that standard one um, in 2010, but it was more focusing on writing. And now when you look at standards 2017, you'll see that it's focused on literacy, reading, writing, communication, language. And we had curriculum and instruction in 2010, and we've updated with current uh, promising practices, instructional practices uh, and curriculum work. Assessment and evaluation, again, the same title in 2010 and 2017, but we've updated uh, the research base and uh, given actually more specificity as to what we're looking for. Standard four was called diverse, diverse learners, I think. Diversity was, uh, was in the title, and now um, we've added equity. We've gotten a lot of positive feedback uh, about the changes to that standard and um, the equity components focus on advocacy, uh, work with families and communities um, who possess funds of knowledge and literacy, literate practices outside of the school. And uh, as far as working with uh, youth, children and families um, to focus on um, their strengths and to also do the internal work of our own to understand our own diversity and our own uh, biases and uh, experiences. Uh, that's quite relevant today, as you know. So the fifth standard is learners and the literacy environment. In 2010, it was more about the literacy environment and we focused on some fundamentals and some research on how to teach learners. And also we've added much more digital literacy um, into this standard. Be, and this was before the pandemic when, when we wrote that. So very timely. The sixth standard has the same name, professional learning and leadership. And again, it focuses on current research, promising practices, and uh, you'll, you'll get some very uh, good ideas as to how to strengthen your program from that standard. The seventh standard is new, and there's a little star there because the practicum clinical experience is, is only for the reading literacy specialist standard. We did not write a practicum clinical experiences standard for the elementary intermediate classroom teacher. So you will want to um, look at that. Some people worry about that one. And so I'll just say that um, we know that advanced uh, candidates in reading literacy specialist work are in their own classrooms. And so they can continue those practicum clinical experiences in their own classroom. And for those candidates who do not have their own classroom experiences, your program can either help them with placement or partner them with another colleague. If um, the program's fully online, uh, we can, you can make that work and we have ideas for you in the standards. So that was the longest part, the what and so why. Why apply for ILA national recognition or um, possibly ILA national recognition with distinction? And I just did a word cloud um, and there's a lot more information on the ILA website that um, the staff will talk about a little bit later. But we've heard from now four programs that have earned the new iteration of ILA national recognition that it strengthens, strengthens their reputation uh, in their area. There's a lot of competition and uh, keeping your program viable and current um, is very important. It's an authentic process of self-study. Uh, there's no one way to do it. Uh, it's, it's how your faculty uh, work together to strengthen your program. And you tell us that story in your self-study. The notion here or the key notion why is because we're looking to improve the quality and um, the uh, 
preparation of literacy professionals. And this process helps, um, helps you do that. You have access to uh, reviews and uh, research materials on the ILA website that we, um, that we highlight as part of our peer review support process. And uh, it also is a way to help you get grants and to um, promote your program by sharing an, what I like calls an asset package. And uh, you'll see some of those materials uh, as, as we go on. They're basically certificates, um, website uh, information that you can add about your national recognition status. And then when? is at least one year prior to when your previous ILA ne national recognition expires. So in when we were partners with NCATE and CAPE, it was a three years before, and this is a big shift. It's one year prior. Now, of course, you can do two years just to play it safe, um, but one year prior will give you enough time for us to get your decision back to you and, and if you need to, to make some changes. For those of you who have not, received ILA national recognition in the past. Perhaps you were with TIAC or AQEP or um, you're new to national accreditation and, excuse me, national uh, recognition or the accreditation process. And so when you do this is on the timeline of when your faculty revises its curriculum and assessment system, syllabi, et cetera, to the current ILA standards 2017. And you'll note this very big change that data is desired, that you've implemented your assessment system and your coursework. But if you it's a brand new course or you've made some significant changes, you do not have to have any applications of data to submit your ILA national, rec national recognition report. Now, I'll um, do, uh, actually I'll stop here. And I see that there are questions in the chat and I just want to double check before I stop if there's anything I should do. Uh oh, you're getting to know each other. I love it. Okay, yes. Um, Joyce Fine asked, is there an updated version of the standards for the preparation of literacy professionals? Uh, yes, if uh, when you go through this um, program, uh, this PowerPoint again, or if you go through um, the I go to the ILA National Recognition website. If you just type in standards 2017, you will see the new publication. It is uh, available for purchase as a PDF or as a bound book. Okay. Oh, and my colleagues from ILA are helping with the link. Thank you so much. Okay, I think those are all that I need to do. So let me share my last slide before uh, we move on. So what I've given you is a, is a quick uh, whip around, as my friend and colleague Rita Bean calls it, of what, why ILA national recognition, and then when do you submit. And up next, we're going to talk about how to apply for ILA national recognition and how to apply to become a peer reviewer and where you can get more information. Please keep using the chat and the question box. Um, that's very helpful for the staff. And then after you get the how and the where, you're going to get to meet the people whose two sets of um, programs who have achieved ILA national recognition, and um, you're going to get to hear, hear firsthand what their experience is and have an opportunity to chat with them. So up next is the how, and this is a video that should start in just a minute. Please write in the chat if you're having any trouble hearing it or anything, and I will adjust. We will now share an overview of ILA National Recognition and ILA National Recognition with Distinction and how to apply as an applicant and a program reviewer. ILA National Recognition recognizes outstanding licensure, certificate, and endorsement programs that prepare reading literacy specialists and elementary intermediate classroom teachers. 
It demonstrates the institution adheres to a rigorous set of standards for preparing literacy professionals and sets it apart from similar programs. It provides a seal of approval granted only by ILA and shows that the program meets or exceeds ILA high standards of excellence. Once your institution achieves ILA national recognition, you may be invited to move forward to stage two to determine ILA national recognition with distinction. This is for the programs that have implemented standards for the preparation of literacy professionals 2017 at its distinguished level. This achievement is the highest honor a literacy professional preparatory program can earn from ILA. To begin the process, we recommend you to review the following resources. ILA National Recognition homepage, ILA National Recognition FAQ, ILA National Recognition Timeline, and ILA National Recognition Fee Schedule. These resources are available online to help guide you through the process. The ILA National Recognition homepage gives you an overview where you can learn more about the two programs. The FAQ webpage answers questions about the National Recognition Program. You can access the FAQ at the bottom of the National Recognition homepage under support. Next is the timeline. The timeline gives you a schedule of the process for ILA National Recognition and ILA National Recognition with distinction for the spring and fall cycles. Here you will find a list of fees for ILA National Recognition and ILA National Recognition with distinction. This gives you a breakdown of the fees related to each stage of the program. Please note that ILA currently has a reduced annual program fee from $1,250 to $500 for those that apply and achieve recognition before June 30th, 2022. If you'd like to learn more about each program, we recommend that you request an information packet. This packet includes a full package of the guidelines for the preparation of your self-study along with the reviewer rubrics. After you had an opportunity to review the materials and resources, we invite you to submit an application. You can find the submit your application button at the bottom of the National Recognition homepage under Take Action. After you submit your application, an invoice for the application fee will be generated and an invoice will be emailed to the billing contacts on your application. Payment will be due within 30 days upon receipt of the date of the invoice. Once payment of the application fee has been received, the report writers will be invited to a webinar to address any questions about the preparation of their self-study. And lessons learned from the previous review cycle will also be shared. Here's a view of the self-study cover sheet and the self-study submission form. A link will be provided to complete this form and upload your self-study and attendance in the system. Following the review process, which can take up to 60 days, feedback is gathered and reported to the applying institution. If revisions or program changes are suggested, the self-study will be recommended to resubmit. Final review is completed and a final recommendation is sent to the institution indicating whether ILA national recognition has been achieved and recommended to stage two site visit. 
Here are the images of ILA national recognition certificates and badges for the Read and Literacy Specialist Program and the Elementary Intermediate Classroom Teacher Program given to those who achieve ILA national recognition. Loyola University of Maryland and University of North Georgia have recently achieved ILA national recognition. You will hear from these two universities following this presentation. Institutions that demonstrate distinguished implementation of standards 2017 will be recommended to proceed to stage two site visit to determine ILA national recognition with distinction. The University of North Georgia's elementary program is currently in this phase. If the institution has agreed to move forward to stage two, it will receive a link to complete this application form for stage two. An invoice will follow for the site visit fee. The institutions that are moving forward will be invited to two webinars. First webinar to discuss the site visit goals and purpose to review timeline and sample agenda for the workroom and to address any questions. The second webinar is to meet with the assigned visitors and to discuss institution site visit draft agenda, logistics, and guiding questions and workroom. A few weeks following the site visit, a final recommendation report with decision will be sent to the institution. If the institution program is awarded ILA national recognition with distinction, it will receive the following. The ILA national recognition with distinction badge, a frame certificate, in recognition in a press release and on social media by ILA, and a presentation opportunity at an ILA event. The University of Texas at San Antonio and West Virginia University have achieved ILA national recognition with distinction from May 2019 through May 2024 for their Reading Literacy Specialist Program. These institutions were part of our pilot program. Their programs are available through ILA National Recognition homepage under ILA National Recognition Recipients. If you're interested in becoming a National Recognition Program Reviewer, you can click the Become a Reviewer button at the bottom of the National Recognition homepage under Take Action. There you will find a list of criteria in order to apply. After you submit your application to become a reviewer, you will be notified in a day or two whether you have been accepted to serve as a reviewer based on your credentials. If selected, you will be notified to complete a conflict of interest form prior to each review cycle. Then you will be receive assignments and an invitation to a webinar training for the current cycle. Thank you for attending this presentation. If you have any questions at this time, you can put them in the question and answer box and we will try to address as many as possible. You may also send an email to ILA National Recognition at reading.org. Again, thank you. Thank you, Diane, uh, uh, for your presentation. At this time, I would like to introduce and invite uh, our team from Loyola University at Maryland, Leah Catherine Thal and Christina Cardona Collins to join in our presentation and share in their experience. 
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christina, and with me is my esteemed colleague, Dr. Leah Saul, who will be with me to present um, a, just a brief overview of our program, some key features of our program, as well as our process in obtaining national recognition. And then we'll share with you some of our insights and then open it up for questions. These are some wonderful pictures of us. <laughs> so about our program, we are a graduate program um, and we serve um, graduate students who are seeking their master's in education or a, and or a post -bac um, bachelor's certificate in our TEL program, which we'll talk a little bit about in a few moments. But our vision is to prepare reflective practitioners um, and educators who help students develop critical reading, writing, listening, speaking, and viewing skills, as well as knowledge necessary to navigate and engage in their world, both academically as well as outside of school. And we fulfill that vision by being founded on principles that are grounded in theory, research, um, as well as evidence-based practices. Um, and we also focus on the social cultural development as well as developmental and theoretical perspective revolving around literacy. We want to enhance teachers' knowledge base um, and their understanding of the reading, writing, and learning connections. One of the things that really sets our, part, our program apart is our Jesuit roots and our connection and focus on literacy being a social justice matter. We really um, believe that is a right to all students. Uh, and so our focus is therefore on the ways in which all people interact in terms of um, reading and writing and the functions in which they use text and in, in their literacy skills um, as compared to their experiences or in relation to their individual as well as social cultural experiences. So there are some key features about our program. We have two tracks for our MED, pro, um, our MED masters and that is our literacy specialist track um, and our literacy teacher for culturally and linguistically diverse populations. Try saying that three times as fast. We do have two supervised practicum experiences for the literacy specialist candidates in which they get to work with K-12 students in both practicum experiences and in small groups or individually. And they also get the opportunity to administer assessments and check the validity of those assessments, provide coaching to their partners, as well as provide um, clinical case studies or reports to families um, and advocate for um, students to utilize those skills um, within the classroom as well that they've learned in that practicum. We also offer a 15 credit teaching English language learner certificate, that's that certificate I was talking about earlier. And um, that is actually open to not just in-service teachers, but also administrators as well. We offer um, for the um, MED and the certificate programs, they both lead to state certification or endorsement for our, um, our graduate students. We have a cohort model with year round entrance, as well as we offer fully online and hybrid options. And so those are some of the key features that make us stand out. And then Dr. Saul is gonna get into our next pieces. Hi everyone, I'm so excited to be here. Um, what you see on your screen is really a roadmap of our three year journey to become not only um, 2017 aligned, but ultimately achieve national distinction. 
So this really began with faculty attending the, actually 2016, but began in earnest with the 2017 ILA conferences and attending all of the events and sessions on the new standards. And once we returned, we really started to engage with our dean and our administration um, to solicit internal funding. Um, we really thought and understood that this revision slash realignment of our program was going to, was going to take a lot of intentionality. Um, and with that intentionality came actual tangible support. And so we were thrilled to receive some internal funding um, that we were able to use to facilitate a two-day literacy realignment retreat. At the time, we had eight full-time faculty who were deeply involved in the realignment process um, and making decisions about how to uh, shift our program from the 2010 to 2017 standards and pretty quickly in this retreat process noticed that it was a lot more than a shift. It was really a revisioning, a complete, a complete realignment. Um, in that process, we realized that one of the most important things that we needed to um, think critically about and gather some data on was our practicum. Um, we knew that we wanted to shift our practicum away from our summer on-campus clinic model to an in-school or district setting. And we knew that that was going to require quite a bit of lift. So like, I guess the intentionally um, slash deranged no, people that we are, we picked the heaviest thing to work on first. Uh, and then hopefully that got the ball rolling downhill, so to speak. Um, so we used our final bit of funding um, to pilot our online practica in the summer of 2018 um, and collect a whole bunch of data from our candidates that year on what went well and more importantly what didn't and what changes and revisions we needed to make as we pushed this out at scale. Um, in the our realignment to the 2017 standards, which I'll talk a little bit more about our retreat process in a second, um, we realized pretty quickly that it was going to result in um, our, what our institution and our accrediting bodies consider a substantial change to our program, which for those of you who are in higher education um, and and familiar, it meant that we were going to have to engage in all of the governance processes, uh, both internally as well as applying for recertification through um, our state certification agency and accreditation agency, as well as ultimately um, make sure that we were aligned to our regional accrediting body. So that process uh, started in the fall of 2018 with, you know, series of reports, at least for our institution, it requires something similar to national report um, that you produce for ILA, as well as lots and lots of meetings and um, lots of opportunities to present your vision, as well as get some critical feedback from your faculty peers and other areas, and particularly in some of our allied areas was really very helpful to us. Um, so we went through that whole process. The one other thing I would add that was challenging was that they were revising our institutional governance process at that time. And so we were the pilot for the whole institution on this new governance process. Um, so all that to say, we would have liked to see this process move a little bit more quickly, um, but it did move very intentionally with all, with all the speed that we could, we could at least push it. Um, but it was a very interesting process. We then moved to our external application. So MHEC is the Maryland Higher Education Commission, I believe is the acronym. Um, we had to seek approval from them. They also had a review process for our application on all of our curriculum. Um, and essentially we were treated as a new program. Um, what was interesting is we had a lot of data about our previous program and how successful it was at meeting the, stand the previous standards and meeting the outcomes that we were really seeking for our students and our candidates. Um, but in many ways, we had to justify our program as if we were brand new. So we had to go through that entire process, not just um, a couple of forms and some revisions. 
um, initially in, in our initial application, we um, proposed running our program as a hybrid model. And that came directly from our candidates and what their needs and wishes were at the time. We were able to implement, well, achieve all of our uh, approvals and we were able to implement in the fall of 2019. In the fall of 2019, we continued to collect data from our candidates as we always do for continuous improvement. And it became pretty clear um, that our candidates were seeking a fully online option in addition to the hybrid option that we were already offering. So we had to apply again to MHEC for an approval for change of delivery method. And then finally, in the fall of 2020, like I said, somewhere between three and four years of where this started, uh, we we're able to offer the program in the fully online version um, that it is today, as well as a hybrid option that's available as well. Um, so we were very, very lucky that that actually coincided um, with our um, structure of the whole university uh, shifting because of the pandemic. So I mentioned our retreat, which in turn we then followed up with, um, we have quarterly, I think that's right, Christina, quarterly literacy faculty meetings with all of us together. But that retreat was really our kickoff where we were able to um, deeply explore the standards. We all came in having read them, having really broke them down, um, done a critical analysis, um, and really thought about what we perceived to be the changes from the 2010 standards and how in turn that was gonna impact our curriculum. Um, again, we realized pretty quickly that this was gonna be a pretty substantial shift. We also had recently implemented in 2017, a dispositions assessment system, um, in addition to our uh, key assessment system. And so we wanted to look at how our disposition assessments aligned with the new standards as well. We were happy to see that there was actually some more intentionality in the 2017 standards in that area. So we were um, happy to see that that aligned potentially even better than it did before. And ultimately, we created what we call um, a standards matrix. So we have every course and every standard in a big Excel spreadsheet and um, thought about what we hit where, so which standards were addressed in which classes and when and how we were assessing them. And particularly, we were always um, focused on, as our program, we want to see growth in our candidates and we want to be able to make sure that we're facilitating and assessing that growth over time. And so as we were looking at these new standards, we wanted to make sure that we were meaningfully teaching and addressing them in multiple points in the program and able to show that. Um, so particularly, you know, those initial understandings of what some of these standards might be all the way to our practical experiences. Um, so we have a, at least one for most standards two, what we call um, signature assessments, where we look at the candidates development and their knowledge of the standard, and then ultimately look at that key assessment at the end of this, of the program for each student. So we created this standards matrix and came to the to the process, um, all in agreement that there was no sacred cows. We all have classes that we teach, that we love. We have content that we teach and that we love. Um, but ultimately, everything was up for grabs and every um, component of the curriculum was on the table when we were looking at this complete revision. Um, the one thing that didn't get put on the table, so to speak, was our vision and mission of our institution and ultimately how we view literacy as a program. Um, but our curriculum was all on the map. This led to uh, some accretion and erosion decisions. We changed certainly some classes, um, but we also changed some, some processes, not the least of which was our clinic. Um, so this, um, this process was really valuable for us to uh, maintain our intentionality around our institutional mission that literacy is a fundamental human right and really make sure that um, our mission is also aligning to these new standards, which was an exciting process.
So that was a lot of work <laughs> before we even got to national recognition. And that's something I think in being with the amazing team at ILA, and we'll talk about how supportive they've been. Um, that's something maybe that doesn't always get talked about. Um, so I put the little track there to say this is, was a marathon for us. It was certainly not a sprint. So on this slide, what you see is essentially, I think, a year's worth of work. <laughs> um, but this year's worth of work was preceded by three years worth of work. Um, we initially chose to um, apply for national recognition for all of the reasons that Diane um, already mentioned and that uh, Marcy mentioned, ultimately we see it as a meaningful opportunity for us to showcase our program and the, the rigor of our program and the efficacy of our program as we support um, not only our candidates, but hopefully the students in K-12 schools and beyond here. So we chose, um, based on where we were in our own processes, to submit for the spring 2020 review cycle. Um, we met with um, our ILA representatives, as well as, I can't remember if we, we did not meet with the actual team, but we learned um, a lot about the processes and how they were going to engage with us. Um, we were able to ask questions. No question was, was too small or too large um, and really better understand how we were going to proceed with this national um, review. We um, spent the next uh, late fall, early spring writing the national review. Luckily, we had just been through all of these other processes and were able to draw a lot of our um, previous um, reports and previous um, applications, pull that, that data into this process. Um, I'll give a little caveat about that in just a second, <laughs> but um, we were able to flip it around and submit um, our self-study in March of 2020. In March, uh, in May of 2020, we received our initial decision, which was a minor revision. And certainly that's not, I think, what we wanted to hear after putting so much time into our process. But it was really invaluable. What the team was able to come back and tell us was, you know, we have a ton of information here. We have obviously lots of work and they could see all the work that we had put into the program. But the writers of the National Recognition Report, myself included, <laughs> um, really turned around for some reason. I, I know why we fall back on our prior knowledge and our experiences and wrote it as if it was a spot report. Um, and really put the privilege on the assessment system versus the privilege on the curriculum. And I know Diane mentioned that, um, but I think it's it was really impactful for me to better understand that through that minor revision process, how much um, we should have spotlighted the curriculum over the assessment system. And that was really a shift in our thinking from doing in CAPE and CAPE reporting. I know someone mentioned that in the chat, so I wanted to kind of hit that specifically. Um, so that feedback was invaluable and really an aha moment for us. Um, we were able to take that feedback and incorporate some minor changes to our report, but ultimately make our program better um, for our candidates and for the students we serve. And that was um, the richest part of this process, I think, for us. So we resubmitted our self-study. It was a quick turnaround in June of 2020 and um, ultimately found out that we received national recognition in August of 2022. We learned a lot in this process as um, I think we all do. Anytime you're looking at evaluating a program, you know, back to the bare bones, it really involved and had to involve all of our stakeholders. We certainly approached this understanding that we needed to involve our faculty and certainly our, our students and former students, our alum. Um, but I don't think I truly appreciated how much input um, our governance bodies were going to be um, providing. And 
honestly, how much better ultimately that made the whole process. Um, and then ultimately that in also engaging our community members um, in, we're in Baltimore, I didn't mention that, um, in Baltimore um, and beyond, especially as we're rethinking our clinical experiences, how that was going to impact the districts that we work with um, was really important as we evaluated our program and made these revisions. Um, as I mentioned, this whole process was very much a marathon. <laughs> and so we had to have those long-term outcomes um, you know, in the forefront of our consciousness, but we certainly had so many short-term outputs that we had to produce to get there. Um, and sometimes those short-term out outputs made it feel like we were two steps backward. <laughs> um, but um, we really had to celebrate the progress that we made at each step along the way um, through, like I said, what was a marathon. And now I think Christina is gonna talk about some takeaways. So here are some key things we want you to take away with as you're thinking about um, applying for national recognition is to critically examine your program alignment to standards and assessment. That was really, really um, critical as you heard Dr. Saul mention that you really wanna go deep in depth and really look at every aspect of your curriculum to make sure it aligns to the standards and that your assessments also align to the standards. You also want to get feedback from multiple sources, um, anywhere and everywhere from academic affairs through um, your outside partners. Um, as um, Dr. Saul mentioned, alumni, they were very um, critical in, um, our, in our decision-making as well as our current students. So you wanna get feedback from everyone and anyone that would have a stake in this, um, in, the, in your change. Um, and then that, con that continuous cycle of improvement, you wanna plan, you wanna implement that plan, fail fast, um, so that way you know what, to, what not to do. And document, um, that is very, very critical. And um, that really helped us with putting together the application and the, um, the um, document, all the, forms and um, reports that we had to submit, just documenting everything um, and collecting that data was also very, very critical. And then repeat the whole process again, um, because there, there's always room for improvement. And just like um, Dr. Saul mentioned, we had to go back and revise and rethink things. Um, so having that continuous cycle of improvement will be greatly beneficial to you. And then plan for in-person, online, and remote clinical experiences to remain flexible. This is something that we learned along the way. We had initially planned for you know, online experiences. We weren't anticipating like many other people and everyone around the world, uh, 2020. And so, but it, we came out of that and we're still learning from that experience, recognizing how flexible we needed to be. Um, so planning for that, um, for your graduate students, but also for the students that they are serving um, will help your program remain flexible as well as meeting those um, standards of diversity and equity um, in terms of technology and, and those things. So that's all that we have. Leah, did you wanna say anything else? Um, just that that flexibility gets to the heart of access, which is something that we want for our candidates and and the, the communities that they serve. So now I believe we're gonna take questions, take a break and question. Yes, um, Leah and Christina, thank you so much. There were a few questions and I see a couple more that have come in. Um, at this point in the program, we worked in a five minute break just because we know it gets a little a little much to sit in one spot for one for a certain period of time. So we're going to take a five minute break. I'm going to have everybody join us back here at 2.04 if you're on Eastern time along with us. Um, and uh, we'll give Leah and Christina an opportunity at that time to answer some of the questions that have come in. Thank you both. Awesome. See you soon.
Okay, thank you. Welcome back, everybody. I am going to let Leah and Christina um, go ahead and share some of the uh, questions and answers that have come through. Um, is that easy enough for you guys to refer back to the document? Okay, great. I'm getting nods. Great. Thank you, guys. No problem. So um, I can go ahead and read the question, and Christina, I'll, I'll ping you. How about that? Okay. Some questions I may toss over to you, though. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> totally fine. I may, I may want to toss them to you too. Um, it'll be great. So one of our first questions was how many courses are in our program? So Christina? There are 10 in the 30 credit MED and there are five in the uh, 15 credit TEL certificate program. And I would just add that we have a literacy core, um, which is six courses, six courses. Yes. Uh, core courses, core coursework, and then four credits of clinical practices, of assessment and clinical practices. So that is the case for both our strands, um, both the MED in literacy reading specialist as well as CLD. So um, all of those candidates take courses together around our literacy core and then break off into their separate um, clinical and practicum experiences depending on their area of focus. Um, what do we use for our disposition assessments? So our institution has a disposition assessment that was implemented at, for our entire department for teacher education. And so we use the disposition assessment for our um, entire teacher education department within our program as well. Um, we are actually, speaking of the continuous improvement, <laughs> um, thinking about uh, moving through the governance structure to revise this because some of the dispositions assessment are, are very targeted toward uh, initial candidates. And so they don't always have some of the components we'd like to see for advanced candidates. Um, and so our dean and our chair are very supportive of that process. But ultimately, we use a disposition assessment process um, that is um, common to our entire department. Um, all right, this one's all you, Christina. How do you manage the 100% online program and practicum experiences? So Christina is our clinical director. Um. <laughs> With a lot of coffee, short answer, a lot of coffee. Um, so the, the program being online is that, you know, the courses are taken fully online um, or in a hybrid. Um, and then the practicum again is online. And what we do is we use um, video um, supervision and then we meet synchronously um, with our candidates um, as a class to review those videos, to offer feedback and for them to also experience coaching of their peers. So, um, so that is the practicum portion, the, the courses, they're also synchronous. We, um, we may have a synchronous class times within a course, but for the most part, at least 90% of the courses are synchronous online, meaning they meet like they would in an in-person class, except for like they are meeting in a virtual environment such as Zoom. Um, I think I answered that question. There's a related question that just came in. Can you talk about... Um... I think this question might be about tech details. So the question was, what are some of the details about what you were using for your online literacy practicum? So can you talk about the, the technological tools that we use for? So for our students, we um, use Zoom. And then Loyola is a Microsoft Office suite designated school. So we use, um, we use Microsoft Stream for our students to upload their videos of the of them working with their with their K twelve students, and there's also, um, you know, on the legal side of things, um, we have we make sure that we obtain permission to record both audio and visual of the students um, working with the K twelve students. So we have that on file. It is also Stream is protected by the university's firewall. And as an added protection, Stream is also um, limited to just that course. So not everyone in the university gets access to that 
to those videos. In it's relation, also, go ahead. I'm gonna jump, jump in. It's also HIPAA and VERPA compliant. Yeah. Um, whereas not all video sharing or um, even programs that I've seen people use to document this kind of thing or HIPAA and VERPA compliant, but that is. So it, we had a pretty high bar from legal. <laughs> it was one of the mil multitude of stakeholders that we had to work through all this with. And um, that was also their recommendation. Our requirement probably wasn't a recommendation from legal to requirement. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. go ahead, Christina. No, absolutely. As far as working with our K-12 students and families, um, oh. 2020 afforded us a lot of opportunity to test out a lot of the digital technology resources that are available to K-12 educators. Also working with school districts to ensure that um, they understood that our, our candidates who were in their schools were utilized, were also doing this program or doing the practicum experience was also key in communicating with those school districts in our area to ensure continuity of um, the practicum for our candidates. So we utilize, cause some also, let me back up. Some school districts mandated that only teachers could use certain programs such as Pear Deck. Some people, they could only use Google um, Meets to meet with students. They couldn't use Zoom for, for different um, technology restriction purposes for their school district. So we had to be very, very flexible. And what we did was we said, you can use any platform to meet um, with the students. Um, and here's a list of resources that we're gonna provide with, to you. We purchased Newzella, we purchased a reading A to Z, um, a lot of digital resources to afford our teaching can our candidates to have access to online resources for literacy. And eventually many of the schools also provided those things as well. Um, I think that covers the um, technology piece. Many of the students also, the K-12 students utilized the, um, the laptops that they're, either that they had personally or that their school districts provided to them. So um, that's one thing I would add. It's a we have that as a requirement of the program that they have to have when they're uh, admitted a um, laptop that's capable of audio and video recording, and that that expectation um, is completely um, that is completely clear from the beginning of the program. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the most difficult part of completing the self study is the next question. And um, I would say, and I'll ask Christina what she'd say, but my answer is that shift in perspective from thinking about writing, authoring, um, and revising a SPA report, or even a, a former report for ILA in the old structure to this new structure that, as I mentioned, is is much more focused on the curriculum, which is great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the what of what we do. Um, but I think for me, that was the most, most challenging thing was really to shift that focus, even though they kept saying it, you just fall back on what you already know and do, unfortunately. Um, and then with that, I will just answer the second question about the example from the curriculum. So um, that's part two, I believe, of the national recognition um, application. And what ultimately we did was went standard by standard and said everywhere in our coursework that we address that standard in curriculum, identifying readings, identifying um, seminal research, certainly, and um, as well as assignments, not just our key assessments, but how we're really developing candidates knowledge over time um, on each of the standards. Um, and like I mentioned before, that was, that was a shift for me in writing um, a report. And so, um, so it wasn't as much like course by course curriculum, but standard by standard curriculum. And then speaking to how multiple courses over time from that developmental spec perspective that I mentioned meet that standard. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, like I said, a pretty big shift for us or for me. And yep, go ahead, Christina, what do you I think? I was also gonna say that we look in doing that, we also made sure that we can in our um, syllabi connecting those assignments to the standards. We began doing that as well um, to make it very 
clear for everyone involved, the instructor um, as well as the students, where those stand, why, why are we doing this? Where do those standards come in to that assignment? And it also helped us when we were mapping out, doing that, ma that matrix um, in order to prepare the self-study um, documents when we did that matrix of identifying um, where those standards were met in those courses and in those assignments. And really building out our assessment system to align with that as well. So not just collecting key assessment data, but collecting data across the program to really be able to identify for each candidate and each cohort, um, how are we doing as a program in developing that knowledge of that standard over time? Um, the next question is, how many full-time faculty members do you have in your program? When we began, we had eight. Now we have six, five? Five. It feels like it shrinks every day. <laughs> um, five. We, I mean, some for good reason. We had um, one of our colleagues retire. Another one of our colleagues just became the dean. So yay, literacy. Yeah. Um, but because of COVID, we have not had the opportunity to rehire. So we certainly are down faculty from where we began. But we're working on it. I'm on the committee. We're working on hiring two new faculty members. So fingers crossed for us, everyone, please. Absolutely. And then we certainly have adjunct faculty as well. But um, as you know, those full-time faculty are key in um, completing something like this. What are some of the details about what, you, oh, we did that one. Uh, last question, I think. Are the graduates working face-to-face -face with struggling readers or are they teaching online as well? They are doing both. <laughs> they are, they, the graduate candidates are full-time teachers. So they're teaching online during the day um, and they're working with students in their schools. So um, they're working with struggling readers, but also not just struggling readers, um, our practicum two or a second practicum allows them to work with even advanced readers or um, readers along the spectrum. So um, they have an opportunity to work with many different um, levels across that continuum. So speaking of the practicum, how do we keep track of it all and provide and prove all the hours? Do they record the sessions? How many hours were required? All the Christina's Amazing worker keeping system. <laughs> so they have, they are required to have 10, um, 10 lessons or um, of one hour each. So that's a total of um, 10 hours of clinical hours. And we keep track of it through the recordings. Um, and it is mandated that they have to have those full one, um, full one hour videos. And because it is um, two practicum, they have to, two practicum courses, it's a total of 20 clinical hours across both practicum. So it's 10 in one in practicum one, 10 in practicum two for a total of 20 clinical hours. In addition to, um, we collect their um, assessment protocols to examine those and make sure those are, um, are valid. So, and, oh, I would say, um, those hours for toward assessment don't count toward their clinical lesson. Mm -mm. No, those are just for the less the actual intervention or instructional sessions. Though those ten hours. And then the other thing I would add is they also uh, this is clinical time because it addresses the standards. Even though it's not with students, is they provide coaching. So part of in practicum two, they have to watch their partners sessions and provide feedback so you know while it is 20 sessions individual and group over two classes there's a lot more hours that are accounted for um, beyond those 20 lessons so to speak yeah and they go through three iterations of the coaching we call it the coaching cycle where they have to um, they have to do a pre-conference with their coaching partner they have to watch and observe their coaching partner's videos then they have to do a post-conference and as well as a reflection um, about that process. And that happens three times. <laughs> and there's in, actually it happens additionally in there. So we mentioned we have a four class clinical block. So they have a diagnostic assessment course that we're not counting any of those hours, but they certainly are clinical hours. 
Um, we're not counting them toward that 20 that we mentioned. And they have a standalone coaching course um, that they're also introduced to the coaching cycle. So they are having an opportunity to practice all that they've all learned in those final two um, practicum courses. That's all. No, no, I don't have any more popping up on the screen. So we appreciate um, your interest in the program. We you know, certainly support the National Recognition Program and our colleagues. And please don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have any other questions or um, need help or just a cheerleader. <laughs> so um, our information for the program is literacy at Loyola.edu. And we have a Twitter account um, and I think other social media as well. We have a Facebook, I believe, um, that I'm not in charge of. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we appreciate your time and um, wish you all the best. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Leah and Christina. Um, I know that everybody appreciates your time and sharing your uh, program, your process, and also your experience through this process uh, with national recognition today. Um, appreciate you answering those questions. At this time, I am going to invite our team from the University of North Georgia to um, go ahead and give a little bit of background on their program as well as their experience with national recognition. Today, we have Danielle Hartsfield, Anne Marie Jackson, Jenny Jones, Nicole Maxwell, and Tiffany Watson from University of North Georgia. Welcome everybody. Hi, thanks so much for um, allowing us to present today about our program. So we're the University of North Georgia and we went through the process for national recognition for our elementary education program. So we submitted our self-study in the fall and on December 15th, we found out that we made national recognition and we were invited to move on to the next phase of the process, which is um, applying for national recognition with distinction. And we actually just completed our site visit on Monday and Tuesday this week. So the information that we're sharing with you today is very fresh. So uh, I hope uh, we offer some information that's informative to you. So we're going to talk about our process for applying for national recognition in the hopes that it will help you um, go through the process yourself if that's something that your program is planning to do. So uh, we're going to start by introducing ourselves. Uh, my name is Danielle Hartsfield and I'm a faculty member in the Department of Elementary and Special elementary and special education at the University of North Georgia. And I'm also the president of the Children's Literature and Reading Special Interest Group um, of the International Literacy Association. Anne-Marie? Yes, hi um, everyone. I'm Anne-Marie Jackson and I'm an assistant professor also in the um, ELE uh, SPED department at the university. I am also the uh, ESOL uh, coordinator for the program. I am Jenny Jones. I am an assistant professor of literacy in elementary and special education. I've taught just about all of our literacy courses, but mostly focus on um, our beginning courses of teaching and reading and writing and the assessment of literacy um, and reading in the content area for our seniors. Hi, I'm Nicole Maxwell. Um, I'm an associate professor also in the elementary special ed department, mainly working with the literacy courses. And um, I am also the reading endorsement coordinator. I'm Tiffany Watson. I'm an assistant professor in the same program and also work with all of the literacy courses. I'm the course manager for our reading and the content areas that Jenny talked about. Um, and I'm also serving on the board of the children's um, literature and reading special interest group that Danielle referenced. All right, next, Nicole is going to give us an overview of the program. Nicole? Yes, so um, our program is an initial, initial licensure program and our students are certified in both elementary education and special education. Um, at the same time, they receive a literacy, excuse me, a reading endorsement. They take four classes um, as part of that endorsement. Um, Jenny mentioned the teaching, reading and writing in elementary school, that's their first one. And then they take um, the literacy assessment course. Um, and in the fall um, of their senior year, they take a reading in the content areas course um, at the same time that they take children's literature 
and um, language arts. So they, um, they get lots of exposure <laughs> um, to different um, literacy courses. Uh, one of the things that uh, we really wanted to do was to connect theory and practice. And a good way for us to do that was for us to start implementing some literacy labs in connection with our classes. And so um, with the two junior level courses, the um, teaching, reading and writing and the literacy assessment, um, we, most of us have kind of gotten into the groove of offering those each time the um, the classes are offered. Um, obviously, COVID-19 played, um, um, you know, put a wrench in some of our plans. Um, but uh, for the most part, we've been able to work around that. Uh, Jenny and I have created mock labs where my um, my son in second grade is, is our lab student. Um, others have been able to get into the schools and certainly hoping that um, in the next year or so, we'll be able to get back to our usual um, situation. The reading in the content areas class, um, a few of us did a, wrote a grant and um, received that to fit in a lab for that class. Um, and we had to kind of put that on hold with COVID, but we are hoping to kind of tweak that one and come back um, to it once things get semi back to normal. Um, the way that our program works is we are, um, we are built around professional development communities. So kind of, you know, professional development school model, but our communities consist of five to six elementary schools for each one of our PDCs. That's, that's how we refer to them. We have seven PDCs. We're a pretty big program. Um, and the teacher candidates that are in our, um, our program are assigned to a PDC their junior year. They are, um, we, we have juniors and seniors. It's two years for our program. And then they're um, typically moved to a different PDC in their senior year. And um, the one of the requirements is that the school that they are placed in within the professional development, either junior or senior year, they have to be in a diverse placement. Um, they may be in diverse placement both years, but at least one of those must be. Um, because they're getting duly certified, they are, um, they, have placements in both general education and special education. Um, so each semester um, uh, leading up to their final internship, they will have two different placements. Um, ideally, one is general ed, one is special ed, but it doesn't always work out that way. But in their junior year, they're going to have two general ed and um, two special ed. In their senior fall, they're going to have one of each. And then um, actually now in their final internship, they do have the option to do uh, special education or um, elementary education. Um, and actually one of the things about the professional development schools is if our communities is um, when it's possible, we'll hold our classes in the elementary school, which works nicely for the labs so that we can take class time and whatever they're learning in our classes, then we can go and apply that working with elementary students and come back and kind of debrief um, on it. Okay, so when we decided we wanted to go through the self-study process, um, we really felt like this was a good time for us because we had already been going through a lot of um, revisions and looking deeply at our courses because of the work we were doing to prepare for Kate. Um, so we had already been doing part of the work that we knew would, we would have to do for the ILA self-study. Um, so we went to discuss this with our department head and our dean because we knew we would need their financial support as well as their technical support. Um, and, and in part, um, when we're looking at the data that we might get from our stakeholders, we knew that the information that we were also gathering from, from CAPE would be very helpful for this self-study. So being able to have their support in multiple ways was super important. Then we had to decide on our team. We have 14 faculty members in our program and eight of them support uh, the literacy courses. And so um, as with anything, you get eight um, academics together and it can be a real mess. So we really had to strategically choose based on our different perspectives, the types of courses we take, teach, and our expertise, who would be, you know, a really good person for this team. Um, so we came up with our team members, and then we really went through and reviewed the requirements, and we kind of had some brainstorming sessions and decided that um, 
But one of the things we do best as a literacy team is we kind of divide and conquer and then come back together. So we thought about what, what are our strengths as individuals? Um, what was the self-study really asking us to do? And where could we work in smaller teams of two and three to gather some of this data, look closely at it, and then come back together to, um, to really create this, this report and make it strong? Um, so um, one of the things we did too is um, that was completely invaluable to this whole situation was being able to um, meet with Diane and the team for questions and answers, not just for um, the, the video conferencing that they provided us, but questions that we had along the way. So if we met as a team, we would be able to generate questions and then have be able to email and get responses right away. So we totally felt supported by ILA throughout the entire process. And once we had our team assembled and really had a goal set from ILA and our lead team member, um, Dr. Hartsfield, we started to put together the information needed for the narrative report or the self-study. Um, and I will say that Google Drive was of very much importance in this process. So we had a lot of folders um, and collaborative documents and that allowed us to really have some independence while still being collaborative. Um, we were looking at each of our courses in relation to ILA standards and that alignment. And I think part of the process that was really valuable, someone earlier mentioned um, the word intentional. Um, and I think intentional and critical are two words that I think um, summarize the process for me at least. And that was because we got to take a really intentional look at how our courses and all of the assignments and readings within them were aligned specifically to the ILA standards. And we weren't doing that as part of creating a syllabus or creating content for a course. We were doing it with a critical eye specifically on those standards. And I know sometimes we get um, distracted by course creation and what we have to teach and grading and all of the things that um, are a part of doing a good job of teaching our teacher candidates. Um, but this allowed us to really take that critical look at what do we say we're doing? Are we really doing it? And then what does it look like? Um, and we started that process with the literacy courses. So in um, Google Drive, we had a document for um, all each of the ILA standards and we filled in a table um, and the table is shown at the bottom of the slide and we started with each person taking one of our literacy courses. There are four core literacy courses our students take um, and then we included some of our elementary courses as well. What we don't want is our our literacy teaching to happen in a silo. We want it to happen across our courses. Um, and this self-study gave us a, an intentional way to look at whether that was really happening. So we looked at our literacy courses um, and focused on um, a critical analysis of where, whether the readings in our courses, the assignments, and the activities that were happening in class were all aligned with the standards. Um, and I know that Loyola mentioned earlier that this really takes a step back from looking just at the uh, big assessments in your course and really looks at the curriculum. And I think that was something that was really valuable to us is we were not just looking at our key program assessments, which I'll talk about in a, sec a second. Um, we were looking at what the semester really looks like for our students. And so while each of us took a course and wrote about that, it did take a lot of collaboration of, well, do you teach this? How do you teach this? What activity do you use? Because across our seven PDCs, we want to present a report that reflects what all of us do, um, not what I'm doing in my course and Jenny is doing in her course, but what are we all doing that's helping us meet those ILA standards? Um, and then we did the same for elementary courses that already had um, ILA standards written into their syllabi. So that was one piece of this self-study that was really nice is that we had already aligned our syllabi to the ILA standards 2017. So we didn't have to go through that entire process um, that Loyola was describing. Um, and I'm very thankful for that. Um, and then finally, after we looked at the courses as a whole and what we were teaching in them, we looked at our key program assessments, um, our key assessments in each course, and then the key program assessments as well. Um, and that gave us an opportunity to see how our students were performing in relation to the standards we said the course aligned to. 
Um, we looked at data for, of the key assessments across three years. Um, and then we looked at our key program assessments. Um, we also use dispositions. We also use the CAPS assessment. So we looked at how the activities in the courses affected the key assessments in that course. And then how did that affect the key program assessment? So our, were our students meeting ILA standards throughout and then also achieving their standards um, for the program as well? So I think this process overall, it's, it is in depth um, and it seems like a lot to take on, but I think it allowed us to really take a look at what we were doing and it gave us a lot to be proud of. Um, and it also allowed us to see some areas where maybe our alignment is not as strong um, and we were able to get that feedback from the self-study team as well. So I, I will go ahead and highlight some of the strengths um, that uh, were um, discussed in the report that we received uh, from the team. Um, when we began the self-study, we were focusing on uh, uh, being as reflective as we could, you know, and ascertaining um, all the um, facts that we could um, get to strengthen um, uh, our service evidence for the, the ways in which our program um, is uh, developed. Um, I'll share some of the uh, ways in which um, we have um, the strengths that we have, but then also highlight some of the uh, recommendations or ways in which we need to improve based on the uh, report um, that we received from the reviewers. So uh, standard one, foundational uh, knowledge, um, the team felt that uh, we definitely have a is that you know a strong uh, a foundation in that um, area. Um, some of the evidence uh, were based on the fact that the different frameworks that we have in our courses, um, you know, from a junior year, our students are engaged in a, 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 co a course where they're learning a very um, instrumental uh, literacy. Uh, frameworks like guided reading, uh, reading and writing uh, writers workshop, literacy stations, and so on. So the, the team felt that we um, were definitely uh, being instrumental in laying out those uh, fundamentals uh, that are critical for teaching um, literacy. The literacy lab, uh, which has been highlighted um, a couple of times before too, they felt um, that the literacy labs were, um, you know, probably one of the, uh, the, the, the strongest area in which our, our students, the candidates were able to demonstrate their understanding of these uh, literacy uh, frameworks um, that they um, learn. Um, as it relates to um, that particular um, standard, uh, one recommendation that they had for us uh, relates to the fact of our students, the need for them to be more uh, critical as it relates to the uh, framework. And so as we reimagine that, uh, we are looking at the literacy courses that um, we have and, and trying to determine the, the, the places, if you will, where we can start having our students become more critical about the uh, framework. Standard two is an area, uh, standard two relates to curriculum and instruction. We uh, got all distinguished in that area. They, the team felt, um, you know, that we did um, an outstanding uh, job in that um, area and our students definitely um, had a, a, a great understanding of how to engage in curriculum and instruction. Uh, our students um, as seniors, uh, one of the courses that they take um, is reading in the content area and the students are able to uh, select, let's say an, an ELA standard and integrate that with either science or social studies and create a unit plan. And in this unit plan, they are able to uh, use different instructional platforms, uh, focus on vocabulary, focus on comprehension, um, uh, also have a text set and so on digital as well as print uh, text. And so all these components definitely so uh, show um, strength uh, in our students having a, a deep understanding of curriculum and instruction. Also, um, there's even a self-study for the seniors in this particular course that I uh, just mentioned where they um, have a, a comprehension strategy lesson and um, you know, two students would develop 
plan and, and develop that uh, strategy lesson. They would uh, teach uh, the lesson. They come back and they debrief and another uh, uh, student teaches uh, the lesson and then they debrief. So the, um, in many ways, they're becoming reflective practitioners. Uh, standard three uh, relates to assessments and evaluation. And uh, the, the team uh, uh, believes that yes, our students had um, ample opportunities for um, um, understanding formally and informal um, assessments. One of the courses that the students uh, take in the, the juniors, that is in the spring, is read 3007. In that course, they learn many um, literacy assessment um, uh, and, they, and they actually practice them in the, the literacy labs uh, with the uh, students. And um, they're able to gain information that they're able to then uh, develop um, instruction, instructional uh, lessons for uh, the students. Uh, but um, if we had to, um, one of the areas in which uh, the team uh, felt that we need to grow is to have our candidates become more uh, uh, reflective as it relates to being, uh, being able to critique some of the assessments. So as we reimagine this, um, uh, for instance, in the, that same course, Read 3007, where they learn the literacy um, assessments, uh, phonemic awareness assessment is one of them where we uh, believe that we can uh, have the students reflect on the assessment and then also um, uh, decide if they were able to um, gather the data that they need. And then also explore the different uh, grade level expectations that, um, uh, that they are able to um, gather from it. Standard four. Standard four um, is probably the area that we um, had our definite need the most improvement in. And standard four relates to diversity and equity. And um, while the team uh, felt that we, um, it is evident um, that our students explore these um, areas. I, I know for um, one of the courses that they, um, the critical, the, I'm sorry, the um, children's liter literature uh, course, they do, um, critique different multicultural texts and um, in language and cognition, which is another course where, that focuses on um, uh, language and also English learners, they do um, engage in uh, looking at different types of learners, primarily English learners. Um, but uh, definitely um, if we, as, as we plan for this upcoming year, we're definitely gonna have our students, uh, for instance, look uh, more at, um, for instance, in the Read 3007 course, ways in which um, we'll, we definitely add a question for them to consider the background of the student that they are um, assessing and, uh, and, and gather as much in contextual factors that they can to, um, to support that uh, assessment. And then also for uh, Read, I'm sorry, the language and cognition course, uh, they do uh, assess students one-to-one -one, and yes, they gather information and they one of the, the, the key assessment, the final key assessment is that they uh, are able to write recommendations for the classroom teacher, for the ESOL teacher, and also for the family. Um, so we'll continue to do that, but then uh, definitely encourage the students instead of having to share that information uh, for the family through uh, the teacher to develop those relationships where they can uh, definitely uh, share the, the information directly to the, um, the family. Uh, uh, standard five, learners and literacy environment. Uh, the team felt, uh, again, the strong evidence as it relates to the, lit uh, the literacy labs that we have and the candidates working with uh, individual uh, students and as they model uh, for the students and confer with them that that's definitely an area of uh, strength for us. Um, as we work this summer and reimagine what um, ways in which we can improve, we'll definitely consider having more modeling, for instance, of digital texts, um, having our students our candidates not only using, uh, for instance, technology to teach, 
but also having their, their students, the little ones, engage in using technology to, um, to research, uh, to construct and deconstruct um, information. The last standard, professional learning and leadership, um, that was also an area that we um, uh, had, um, we, need, we definitely need to grow in. And so uh, we're, again, we're gonna, uh, our students this year engaged in uh, professional development. We had uh, four uh, professional uh, development for them. Um, uh, two were mandatory and for each semester that is, and two were voluntary. Uh, the, we'll definitely continue uh, those, but as it relates to leadership, which is a part of this standard, uh, we, uh, one uh, area we think is that our students can also, the seniors can also uh, develop, uh, I'm sorry, our, our seniors can also uh, prepare and, and plan for professional development that they can then present to the juniors. And so um, uh, those are ways in which we think we can develop in uh, that particular uh, standard. So um, the advice we have for you, um, some of which you've, you've kind of heard as we're going along, um, that selecting your team members, being um, strategic about that. Um, as Jenny mentioned, you can't throw too many people in there, um, but we all have our strengths and our areas for growth. So finding those that complement each other so that um, you can you kind of fill in any gaps that there might be, people who are willing to collaborate. Um, those who are willing to admit when they don't know something or they need some help. I mean, I think those are some, um, I mean, that's how I want all of my colleagues to be, but certainly when you're, you know, um, selecting your team, you have to be strategic about that. And also knowing who's going to follow through on, on um, what they've committed to do. Um, Jenny is our table lady. <laughs> She's big on tables and they are very helpful for organizing um, information and being able to show the data. You saw um, on the slide where Tiffany was talking um, how we had the table that was aligned by the, the ILA standards and we could go through and look at each class and um, figure out what readings went along well with that and topics um, and just having that organization um, was was wonderful to have that there, but also when we're doing data from our key assessments, um, being able to look at that so that we could develop narratives that um, really thought through, okay, what are the qualitative reasons behind what we have going on there or what might they be? Um, and because we were in, in the midst of CAPE um, accreditation, we had a good bit of data that we were able to work with, which was wonderful. So if you have it, take advantage of it. Um, no need to reinvent the, <laughs> the wheel there, you know. Um, so if it's there, definitely do it. Planning ahead is also important because um, we know we're all busy. But um, I mean, we needed information from people who weren't a part of our self-study team and they needed extra notice that, hey, this is what we're working on. Um, and we, so we kind of had to get a little bit of buy-in. You know, we need your help. Um, could you please share your, your CV or um, can you get this um, syllabus? And just knowing that, okay, we need to have this time to um, gather all the information. And then for us looking at it, and maybe set those dates a little early because you always have things that come up. Um, you know, a pandemic, I'm just kidding. We were already in that. Um, so just kind of thinking um, about just giving yourself that cushion, I think is a, is a good idea. Um, so that organization is um, very helpful. Um, and then communicate frequently, be open to, um, to talking with one another and, um, and do that often. So um, to, to piggyback kind of on what Anne-Marie was saying, as we, as we got our report and we were celebrating our successes and we were continuing to um, look at ways to grow, we, um, we wanted to prepare for our site visit um, to go further with the recognition process. And to do that, 
Um, we had to negotiate selecting the dates. We had to work with our reviewers. Our dean was really important. We, we needed to make sure that this was a time where our stakeholders could come together. So there was a really, you know, trying to negotiate those times was, was pretty important. Um, we also had to, like we did with the self-study, we had to determine um, some tasks and internal deadlines. So as Nicole was talking about, we had that, um, the, the CAPE data, um, numerical data on our, how our students had done across assessments, but now we had to really qualitatively analyze that data because it wasn't really required as a part of our self-study initially, but we wanted to dig even deeper in preparation for that site visit so that we could really um, share with our visitors more about our program and reflect a little bit deeper about what were some of the things that the trends we were seeing across the years of our students in that data. Um, we had to reach out to um, our students, our partners, principals, alumni, considering who could articulate their experiences with our program and really showcase who we are and what our program is and um, find time that they were available to, to do this within our site visit. Um, and then we developed a virtual workroom. Um, and again, as Tiffany noted earlier, we used that Google Drive. It was invaluable. Um, it, it kept things very, very organized. And as a matter of fact, that was one of the things our site visitors really complimented us on was how organized that information was because we had to put everything from our self-study there, but then extra material. So we, we provided examples of student work samples from key assessments so they could see what an A paper might look like compared to a C paper. So they could see that we were examining things across um, the curriculum. So we provided a lot of support there along with um, descriptions of our school partners, contact information about our schools and things like that. Um, so we really tried to set um, that experience for our site visit up to be as successful for our visitors as, as possible, especially since it was going to be virtual, but also create it so that it was easy for us to manage in preparation for them. So we're very much looking forward to uh, receiving feedback based on our site visit and we're going to find out um, next month. So we're very excited about receiving that feedback and uh, ILA's decision. Uh, so I believe that we are taking a short break before we go to Q&A. Um, Angela, do you want to um, talk about that, the break? Yes, thank you, Danielle. Um, and thank you to the whole uh, UNG team for providing their experience and their uh, information about the program and the process. I know we were scheduled for a break. I don't see any Q&A that was posed. So I'm going to take that as you guys did an awesome job. <laughs> of going through your program and um, all of the ins and outs of the process that you experienced while you went through the national recognition process with ILA. So thank you for that. Um, I don't know that we need to take a break per se um, at this point, uh, but I what I would like to do is, um, I know that you guys have your tiny URL there on your uh, your uh, slide. And I do uh, wanna remind everybody that we'll have a resource page that will um, have additional information on it following the presentation when the on-demand viewing is available. So I'll add that tiny URL so people can check out your, um, your site there. Um, at this time, I am going to go ahead and share my screen. Let me just do that. And I know that um, Diane uh, really wanted um, everybody to, um, you know, get as much information out of the session today as they possibly could. But I know she was interested to see what uh, key takeaways um, the participants from today's session were going to, um, you know, take away with them and uh, possibly utilize those takeaways so that we can, um, you know, share them amongst the group, but also use them to uh, improve the programming as we go forward. So if you want to share your key takeaways in the chat or in the Q&A box, we would really appreciate that from all the, intend the attendees today. And I'll just give a second there for people to type in if they're, if they're typing in. I also want to reiterate um, this afternoon that there might have been a few questions that were specific 
um, that I would like to forward on to uh, Dr. Kern for her feedback, and I will do that following the presentation today. So if you didn't get a direct reply to a specific question, um, all of those have been noted, and we'll go ahead and put together some documentation, and we'll follow up with you as, a, as an attendee separately on any um, specific questions that may have come up. Um, again, if you have something that comes to mind now or after um, we're done in the session today, please, please, please reach out to uh, ILA National Recognition at reading.org and the National Recognition team will be sure to um, uh, have a response to your inquiry. And I would just like to thank again, um, everyone for joining us this afternoon listening in and sharing your questions as well. Um, another big thank you to our guests and those institutions who have achieved ILA recognition and those that joined us today. Um, just a little bit of re repetition here, but the recording of this webinar should be available by Friday, May 7th. Um, and we're going to, in addition, post a link to an evaluation form in the chat. Um, so that you can provide some feedback for today's event. Um, we will also send the same evaluation link out via email following this uh, session if you prefer to uh, review it later. So you can click on the link now out of the chat or you can wait for the email to come either way. Um, I also want to encourage everyone to keep an eye out um, on the ILA Digital Events webpage for on-demand content as well as upcoming webinars and learning opportunities. Um, you can see on the screen there that we're going to have an ILA Children's Literature Intensive on May 11th, and that's an evening event. Um, and we're very excited about that. So uh, there's more information on that uh, particular event on our uh, digital events webpage as well. And if you're not already following ILA on social media, please make sure to do, to do so, so you can uh, find the, the most up-to-date information on events and also programs that we have. Um, at this time, I would like to thank everyone again for joining us this afternoon, and I appreciate you all um, for taking the time to join us and share. Have a good afternoon, everyone.